In this video, we will talk about syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Let's begin with the normal function of ADH in our body. This is our brain. Antidiuretic hormone is formed in the hypothalamus and it is secreted through the posterior pituitary gland. ADH then acts on the nephrons which are the functional unit of the kidneys. In the nephrons, it causes water reabsorption in the blood from the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. ADH also causes vasoconstriction, that is constriction of the blood vessels. That is why it is also known as vasopressin. In SIADH, the secretion of antidiuretic hormone is inappropriately high, due to which there is increased reabsorption of water. This excess water retention then dilutes sodium, which means that it decreases the level of sodium in the blood, causing hyponatremia. SIADH has countless causes. These include malignancy, most commonly small cell lung cancer that secretes ectopic ADH. Anything that affects the neurological system can cause disruption in ADH secretion, like stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, meningitis, encephalitis, abscess. Infections such as TB and pneumonia are also potential causes of SIADH. And drugs that act on central nervous system, such as antipsychotics and antiepileptics, also sulfonylureas can increase ADH secretion. Signs and symptoms of acute hyponatremia do not precisely correlate with the severity of hyponatremia. Some patients with profound hyponatremia may be relatively asymptomatic. Anorexia nausea, vomiting, and malaise are early symptoms and may be seen when the serum sodium level is less than 125 milli equivalent per liter. A further decrease in the serum sodium level can lead to headache, muscle cramps, irritability, drowsiness, confusion, weakness, seizures, and coma. These symptoms occur as water shifts into the brain cells, causing cerebral edema and raised intracranial pressure. SIADH is best defined by the classic criteria introduced by Barter and Schwartz in 1967. The criteria can be summarized as follows. We know that in SIADH, there is increased water reabsorption that causes decreased sodium levels in the blood by excreting it out through urine. So the serum sodium and serum osmolality will be decreased and urine sodium and urine osmolality will be high. Also, even though there is water retention in the body, it is not enough to cause hypervolemia. So the volume status of the body will be normal or euvolemic. Before diagnosing SIADH, we should rule out other causes of hyponatremia. For example, adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, pituitary insufficiency, etc. If hyponatremia is caused by SIADH, then it should correct after restriction of fluids. Treatment of SIADH depends on the degree of hyponatremia, on whether the patient is symptomatic, and on whether it is acute or chronic. The first step in the management of SIADH is to establish the cause and treat it. The second step is fluid restriction. It involves restricting fluid intake to 500 milliliters to 1 liter maximum. If sodium is not corrected after 24 to 48 hours of fluid restriction, then consider pharmacological therapies. Tolvaptan is the first line medication used to treat SIADH. Vaptans are ADH receptor blockers. 
they are very powerful and can cause a rapid increase in sodium. Therefore, they are usually initiated by a specialist endocrinologist and they require close monitoring. For example, we need to check sodium every 6 hours. Also, 5% dextrose and desmopressin slow the rate of correction. Demeclocycline, which is a tetracycline antibiotic, inhibits ADH. These are the three Ds which you can remember are used in the treatment of SIADH. It is essential to correct sodium slowly to prevent central pontine myelinolysis. Aim for an increase in sodium levels up to 6 to 8 millimoles per liter in 24 hours. Central pontine myelinolysis, also known as osmotic demyelination syndrome, is usually a complication of long-term severe hyponatremia. Being treated too quickly, that is more than 10 millimoles per liter, increase over 24 hours. As the blood sodium levels fall, water moves from the area of low concentration of solutes, that is the blood, to the area of high concentration of solutes, that is in the brain, through blood-brain barrier. This process is called osmosis. This causes the brain to swell. The brain adapts to this change by reducing the solutes in the brain cells so that the water is balanced across the blood-brain barrier and the brain does not become edematous. This adaptation takes a few days. So if the sodium is corrected rapidly in the blood, the water will move out of the brain cells quickly, causing the compression of the fiber tracts and demyelination. This causes two phases of symptoms. In the first phase, patients present as encephalopathic and confused. They may have a headache or a nausea and vomiting. These symptoms often resolve prior to the onset of the second phase. The second phase is due to the demyelination of the neurons, particularly in the pons, hence the name central pontine myelinolysis. This occurs a few days after the rapid correction of sodium. This may present a spastic quadriparesis, pseudobulbar palsy, cognitive and behavioral changes. Prevention is essential as the treatment of central pontine myelinolysis is only supportive and a large proportion of patients either die or are left with some neurological deficit. That's it for today. If you like the video, then don't forget to share it with your friends and keep following me for more educational stuff. Take care. God bless you all.